What's up everyone? I'm Jess and today I'm here with Advite. We're actually going to talk about a feature that's launching today. Most of this video is going to be delving a lot into the crazy technical complexities of like building this feature. How we handle text rendering and warp, line wrapping for multi-line commands, scrolling, text selection in the input editor, as well as like communicating between warp and the shell. I want to extend a challenge. Guess how long it took for Advite to build this feature. Put that guess in the comment section of this video and then you can confirm to see if you're right at the end. So let's get started. Advite, can you start by giving some context as to what you built? Yeah, so we're calling this feature same line prompt. And this is actually one of our most highly requested features, uh, I think just behind Windows support and other OS support. And so I think it's easiest to actually demonstrate this visually. So on the left-hand side, uh, you can see um, this is the previous uh, version of Warp. On the right-hand side, you can see this is my current version of Warp. Uh, and you can see the key difference here being that on the left, we're adding this artificial new line into um, your shell prompt. And on the right, we're uh, correctly respecting your shell prompt. And you can start typing, like, let's say, a command right here, right beside your prompt. In essence, that's the kind of feature we were trying to build. Uh, and the reason why users really cared about this, uh, you can see some of these reasons outlined in this GitHub thread, was one is just simply familiarity. They're coming from these terminals where, in some cases, people have been working on the terminal for decades, and um, they always expect their command to be right next to the prompt. Uh, and in Warp, the default experience, which is the command was below the prompt, is just like a jarring experience, especially if you're so used to something working the way that it is, along with the fact that like certain prompts just simply break, right? You can see here, this is supposed to be a two-line prompt with power level 10K. Um, if you try using this within Warp, um, this just looks wrong, right? Like we were trying to get the chevron, um, which is supposed to be on the same line as the command, but now we're having this like new empty blank line being added in. What what got you to choose this as your because this is your first uh, task as a full time employee at Warp? I'm curious, like why choose this issue? Yeah, yeah, I, I think a big part of it was just how like how much it was affecting our users. Like uh, even in this thread, for example, you can see that a lot of folks are churning off of Warp um, yeah. just due to this reason, and I think it, it really hurt me that. It was like seemingly such a small thing, but it really mattered to our users. And, and I can understand why again there as well. And I uh, did not expect to for, for it to take me like a journey across Warp. But yeah. I think it was pretty awesome that it did because it allowed me to like learn a lot more about Warp as application than I originally knew yeah. uh, kind of getting into this. We've talked a lot about like the different approaches you took when considering like how to implement this. Um, but actually, can you just talk through like the final approach? That's a good question. So uh, one of the differences within Warp is that um, this input editor is actually a real modern text editor. And so what I mean by that is that uh, within Warp, let's say I type in a git commit m or something, I can actually select text, I can delete text, all of the stuff that you love, uh, know and love from Warp. Previously, uh, if you look on the left-hand side here, we had like this grid component that was above this input editor component. This is pretty easy, right? If you think about layouts kind of thing, uh, just plop one thing above and then put another thing below. Now, if we go back over to this, so let's do a few free commands like this, uh, we will still want this to like render correctly. You can imagine that now this is like no longer just like a bunch of nice rectangles on top of each other. It's some sort of more complicated layout going on. Like let's say I, I, I run a command here, so do this. So um, these first six lines of the prompt are actually separated from this last line of the prompt, which is this BAR with this percent sign. If we ha if we try to do this entire thing, like the the normally the grid would go to the end of this this E right here, and this would be a very long grid. Uh, but now if we split it into two grids, we can have this like grid up here, which is like pretty big, um, and then we have this the second grid, which is can be truncated all the way, uh, and then that allows us to have an easier time now putting these commands and all of the input editor stuff beside beside the prompt. And the reason why we do this with the warp is that it allows us to do all of this really fancy intelligent stuff where we actually understand the different parts of what you're doing. Like we know what is a prompt, what is your command, what is your output. One of the core things that now has to change is that we're essentially introducing this left notch of sorts into the input editor. And by left notch, I specifically mean the last line of the prompt. So this bar with a percent uh, is being treated as a left notch. And so if you think about like a rectangular cutout, um, you're like cutting out the top left corner of this rectangle and we're calling that the left notch. There's a few related concepts here that need, also need to change. And so um, two, two per pertinent ones are selections and wrapping. Yeah, let's start, perhaps start off with scrolling since that's the most relevant to, to the notch. And so if I go back over here, I start typing whatever, uh, you can see that the prompt kind of stays there as I start typing this really long command. However, with this sort of experience, 
uh, you would expect as a user that the prompt would start scrolling along with whatever you're typing. Uh, that would just be the most intuitive product experience. This is one, actually one of my PRs um, for uh, adding the scrolling logic uh, for the input editor with respect to saline prompt. I think that was one of the fun parts within Warp was like thinking about how does adding this this sort of like top section and then adding this notch component kind of change some of these things. And so um, specifically now, as I mentioned, we want this the rest of the input editor to scroll along with um, the prompt. And so we want to keep it in, like have optimizations such as figuring out like what is the first usable row, right? We don't want to render anything that is off screen yeah. because that's just wasted rendering. Um, and so that's what some of this logic here is doing. Um, for example, this function is figuring out what is the index of the first usable row given the current scroll position. Here, for example, we figure out what is the height of the top section in line, like fractional lines essentially, um, and then account for that with our adjusted scroll position and basically have this offset for any sort of calculations we're doing. There's also like some additional nuances here. For example, within warp, uh, we have uh, auto scrolling. So like if I click up here, uh, we auto scroll uh, as soon as you get near the top or the bottom of whatever uh, kind of window you have open. It's not like this wasn't taken into account before same line prompt. Like what about same line prompt like added complexity to this logic? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, yeah, we, we did have to account for a lot of this before, um, even, even before same line prompt was a thing. A large part of it was just like editing the right pieces of this in order to account for um, this like top section and left notch correctly. So that offset, yeah. for example, is not as relevant for scrolling, but still applies and is very relevant for selections. Basically this challenge of translating um, from one coordinate space to another, another. As I click around here, um, my mouse is clicking somewhere on, on, on the screen here. And there's this kind of coordinate space that we have with respect to the window. And so we have some X, Y coordinate there. And then there's also the coordinate space of um, the input editor itself. This S right, for example, should be like row zero, column zero in that coordinate space. Um, this F is like row one, column zero. Uh, and so previously this kind of translation was a lot easier, but now we have this special case of this first line and basically accounting for the fact that row zero, column zero of the first line is actually starting offset over a bit. Uh, this is part of the logic that I added. So if we're on row zero, we're actually shifting over um, the left notch itself, uh, or, or like accounting for the left notch essentially. Gotcha. And so this position, we're uh, subtracting that offset that we need there. Yeah. Very interesting. So you've covered scrolling, you've covered text selection. Are there any other like interesting uh, kind of waterfall uh, effects that this had on other, other things in Warp? Yeah, yeah. So we can touch on um, wrapping wraps next. And so here I've just, uh, on this first line of the second line, you can see that this is a soft wrap going on. So what I mean by soft wrap is that this line is just wrapping. I haven't added in like an actual hard, hard wrap there, like a new line. Now this gets a bit deeper into text layout and glyph rendering. We can probably talk for hours for, for how glyphs are rendered and how all that works. But um, but yeah, we, we uh, actually don't do this within like the core warp logic itself. Within Mac, for example, uh, if folks have used uh, the core libraries, Mac has these core libraries. So this is uh, Apple's core text library. Um, so this is for creating text layouts, uh, font handling, font metrics, clip data. Basically think about, we're giving Apple this kind of input of like, this is a box we want, and this is the text that we want to put in the box. Uh, and this is the font and whatever other things that we have pertaining to the text. Like, can you tell us uh, where to wrap the text correctly? And that's the kind of problem that Apple helps us solve. One of the things you can imagine is as I'm typing, uh, kind of, if we didn't do this correctly, this soft wrapping would actually go a few letters beyond uh, the end of this line. That's some of the interesting problem that comes up is like, how do you tell Apple or whatever text layout library you're using um, that this first line is special? Uh, again, going back into the sim code here, we, we actually used a bit of a hacky approach here. We're using this uh, CT paragraph style specifier for first line head and end. Normally, this is meant for head and ends. And so what I mean by that is uh, for folks that have done like five paragraph essays or whatever and stuff, uh, your English teacher probably told you like always indent in your paragraphs and stuff, um, only indent in that first line. And so uh, Apple has a special kind of op option that allows you to define and head indent uh, for exactly that reason. Um, but you can also imagine that that left notch that I just told you about is basically an indent, right? If you if you ignore all the stuff around prompts and stuff, it's just basically an indent. And so we were actually able to leverage this first hand, head indent thing um, in order to do wrapping correctly, which was a really nice thing to be able to do because the other option I was considering here um, was being uh, was defining uh, essentially a custom polygon. It's possible to do, but it would be kind of quite a bit messier. And I, I think one of the other cool technical bits here was this is actually one of my personal first times uh, dealing with what's called FFIs. So these are foreign function interfaces. And so 
Here you can see some of these FFIs being used. Uh, and so these are actually calling out to objective C functions uh, on Apple's side. And so um, what this allows me to do is I basically define the declarations for some of these types and functions, but I don't actually implement them, right? I just, I just tell Rust in this case um, that these things exist and Apple has written these things uh, and I want to be able to use these things. Uh, and in some cases, this requires like unsafe Rust blocks and such. Um, and so definitely a bit, bit more painful because you don't have like the same level of like intelligence, for example, when dealing with um, FFIs, but, but it was very cool to be able to directly call essentially objective C Apple functions from like a log rust file, um, which is pretty awesome. On the Linux side, we actually use, um, this open source library called cosmic text. Uh, and so we actually added, um, the functionality, um, into, into this library for, uh, this is actually on their to-do list was wrapping with indentation. Actually, do you want to show the code that you showed me yesterday? So yeah. We're adding like this option into the API, essentially. This is first like new option for first line indent, which is uh, um, optional. For example, you can pass in some F32, which uh, is the pixels here. Yeah, so you can see this is like part of the core logic. So uh, the current line width, um, if we are on the first line, then we're subtracting away this first line indent. You even mentioned that um, considering indentations is one of, uh, is listed in one of their like future work for the for the team so you actually implemented it already for them possible to try to get that merged in so that you know everyone else can can use that that fork as well this whole time we've been talking about the input editor and prompt in the context of typing new commands but i know there was also complexity in terms of the concept of finished blocks rendering them so can you talk me a little bit through uh what you had to consider in building that part yeah for sure uh, and just to clarify when we were talking about finished blocks what jess is referring to here is if we type in like a few commands, you can see these these are uh, two finished blocks, for example. And so we're referring to like these commands that have been run already, as opposed to what we just talked about with the in input editor and the text and how we're representing it here, uh, which is more of a modern text representation using like binary trees and such. Uh, over here, all of the text is being represented inside of this 2D grid of cells. This is kind of an entirely separate problem to some extent than uh, the problem that we just tackled of doing same line prompt in the input editor. How it used to work is that we used to have this prompt grid up here. We used to have the command grid, and then we used to have the output grid. And so there's three grids essentially going on. Now the challenge of line prompt is that we essentially want to combine this prompt to command. At a very high level, we're basically just combining this two grids into one. Uh, and so although that sounds easy, there's just a lot of downstream effects that that has within warp. Can you give some examples of specific, like these downstream effects that you had to take into consideration? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, the first one we can touch on is, is um, this challenge of like maintaining demarcation between the prompt and the command, uh, even though they're now part of the same grid. Again, thinking about traditional terminals, uh, in a traditional terminal, the entire terminal is one grid. And so the terminal does not really care w like where, what ca each character is and stuff. The terminal, basically you type stuff into it, pa it passes off to the shell, the shell gives it characters back and then represents those characters on the screen. So you have these bytes going back and forth between the terminal and the shell. Uh, within warp, we, we of course have some of those things happening as well. Although we somewhat care a bit more about um, like what exactly is the prompt, right? What exactly is the command? What exactly is the output? For example, you can see that the command here is bolded, right? That's like a warp level thing that's happening. Other things you can do, for example, is like, let's say I right click on this block and now I can copy the command specifically, right? And so if I copy the command, I just get PWD. If I go back here, copy the prompt, um, then I just get the prompt. Previously, this was easy, right? For, for things like copy prompt, copy command, you just grab everything from a grid and just throw it in. But now we're forced to essentially put these two grids together because if we don't put these two grids together, um, it's almost impossible, right? To get the soft wrapping, the hard wrapping, all of that stuff to work correctly in the context of a grid. Um, and so what we've done now behind the scenes is that there's actually a marker that you can't see that's being put on, on the last lot, like cell that the prompt is using. And so in this particular case, for example, I'm using this percent sign as a separator between my prompt and my command. In that cell, there's this hidden kind of bit of information that indicates to warp that this is the last cell of the prompt. We kind of track that piece of information uh, even as certain uh, terminal interactions are happening, right? So for example, you can like resize the terminal, right? So this is a bit easier to show with, with a longer prompt, but even with this prompt, like if I resize to something like this, you can see that this percent sign is getting moved around and such, uh, and then I can resize it back. And so even it's get, when it's getting moved around, we still want all of these actions to work correctly, right? Copy prompt, copy command, whatever and stuff. And so basically keeping track of these demarcation across kind of the resizing of a terminal uh, was a pretty interesting challenge. And yeah, so you can see some examples here of our resizing code. So this is a similar, our code is somewhat similar to Alacrity. Um, and so 
Uh, here we have like things like shrink lines, grow calls, and such. So these directly correspond to each of those different resize operations that can happen. Uh, and then looking at some of this code, you can see there's there's a lot of things that you need to manage as you're reflowing text, right? Because you're essentially re reflowing this text from a smaller grid to a bigger grid or whatever. You might need to add or remove soft wraps and hard wraps. Uh, and so we need to keep track of these soft wraps, for example, using special flags. So using like the wrap line flags. Um, there's also complications with Unicode going on. With certain Unicode characters, you can imagine they actually take up two cells instead of one cell. Um, and so we use these wide care spacers in order to keep track of that. And so basically there's a lot of this weird kind of math and, and stuff going on with resizing um, that is now a bit, bit like grows in complexity because it's sitting on a prompt essentially, because now we need to make sure that this, this mar demarcation marker is being tracked correctly. Interesting. Um, is this not handled by like cortex? Why are we doing the math on, on a warp side? I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's a good question. And so that kind of goes back to this, uh, like div the differences between the grid and the text editor piece of this. And so when we're rendering text in this input editor, that's more tradi like traditional text rendering. Like we're doing it similar to like how any other app, like a Mac application, for example, is rendering text. But we're rendering text in the context of the grid um, in finished blocks. We're doing it like much more similar to how a traditional terminal renders text. And the, the reason for that is because terminals and shells communicate using like a variety of different sequences. Um, uh, these are known as NC escape sequences. And so we need to make sure that we're following, like we're backwards compatible essentially with um, normal terminals things and normal CLI things. The downstream effects of that mean that like this entire thing again is this 2D grid of cells. And this is like inherently basically a different data structure compared to our text editor down here. And so the way that we render text across these two different things is is similar, but not the same, especially when it comes to text layout, for example. Text layout up here is much closer to like a terminal kind of text layout, as opposed to text layout down here, which is closer to like a Google Docs or Mac, like uh, pages kind of text layout. Very, very interesting. Yeah, uh, you know, I never would have uh, expected there to be such a difference between like the logic behind the finished block and, and the logic behind like the, the input editor, because they look so similar, right? But yeah. it makes sense when you're, when you're speaking about it that there's just so many nuances. Uh, yeah, I, um, I think our goal from a user facing point of view is that the user should actually never realize know. that these yeah. two things are different. <laughs> unless they watch unless they watch this video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything else with finished blocks that you want to touch on? Yeah, so uh, I guess one of the other fun challenges is this piece of, of uh, we actually support two different types of prompts in Warp. And so, so far we've been focusing around the shell prompt piece of this, um, which is um, I think primarily like most users that care about same prompt, for example, are using shell prompts. But again, we do have the warp prompt uh, within warp as well. And so um, this is this prompt they can actually build by just dragging pieces around in warp and stuff. It's a pretty awesome prompt, would recommend trying it out. Um, but yeah, we also wanted to give people the option to use same line prompt up uh, with this warp prompt. And so now this is uh, warp prompt. Uh, and this is same line prompt in the input editor going on. So all the stuff that I said a lot around um, the notches and stuff, again, the same thing here. Um, but the interesting part here is uh, the fact that previous the previous behavior of warp is that the command starts at position zero. Um, the pos command is starting at column zero. However, with uh, the case of the show prompt, uh, you can see that the command is starting at position six here. There was a difference between like the shell advancing the cursor. Uh, and when I say cursor here, cursor does not mean like text cursor. This is like the next cell to which you should be writing a character. And so uh, as you start typing something in, for example, let's say I do like a seek uh, zero 10,000 or something like that, you can see that cursor that you just saw at the bottom there. Um, and that's the cursor kind of cursor referring to. Uh, and so making sure that cursor kind of lines up correctly between the shell and the terminal is extremely important because if it doesn't, you kind of run into these cases of you might get duplicated characters and you might get some sort of weird behavior in your terminal. Um, one of the challenges there was like, how do you communicate that this, uh, how you move the cursor should change between warp prompt and shell prompt? The way that this is done behind the scenes is using something called a bind key. And so uh, folks may have defined their own bind keys um, within other terminals. You can actually define a custom bind key. Like let's say I define a bind key control P or something. I, I can do some sort of special shell level action that corresponds to control P that essentially sw helps switch, uh, like trigger a shell function um, that is actually running in a separate process compared to warp. So before before you go into the code, just just to summarize my understanding, there is the shell prompt, which is like if you use like you know your own custom prompt, or you're using like P10K or Starship or whatever, that is your PS1 prompt. 
Um, and like the default is now that is like same line prompt. Your prompt and your command is going to be on the same line. And that's all of Advate's work. However, Warp has a separate option, which is the Warp prompt, which is our like our logic for what we think the prompt should be like, which is like the prompt and the command are on different lines. The existence of that basically left notch can 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 fuck with the coordinate system basically, right? So it's important to tell the shell uh, if you're using the warp prompt or if you're using the shell prompt because the warp prompt doesn't have that left notch and the shell prompt does. And then what you're saying is you do this, you give the shell this signal by using bind keys, and that is what you're about to show us in the code. Yeah, yeah, I think exactly. Okay. And so one of the the interesting pieces to note actually with our previous behavior on the left hand side here is that we basically suppressed the shell actually moving the cursor. And so there are actually like these special escape sequence uh, or sequences you can use um, on the shell side that suppress cursor movement. And so we told the, the shell that this entire thing, you should actually not move your cursor a single bit, right, for this entire prompt. And so that's how we started the, the cursor at the right spot here, uh, which is 0, 0 um, for this. Yeah. Because again, remember, this is an separate, entirely separate grid, right? This is a new grid that's being exactly. started. Um, it's saying or the prompt, like ignore the prompt. Yeah, yeah. essentially, um, which is which is uh, yeah a, b a bit hacky and stuff. And so it's actually nice now that we because uh, one of the side effects of this uh, for users that are in Bash and Fish, you'll be happy to know that a lot of prompt plugins uh, actually will have better support after same line prompt because uh, oh nice previously in That's Bash awesome. and Fish we and also because we were suppressing what the default behavior is kind of. Yeah, so part of, like one of the one of, one of the ways we were doing that in Bash and Fish was that we were actually sending the prompt via JSON payload, uh, and so we were like pre-processing the prompt and sending it via JSON payload um, uh, from the shell process over to Warp and stuff, and then Warp was like putting it into the grid, uh, and basically we were not doing like uh, we we're not processing the prompt in a similar way to how normal terminals process it, and uh, now we with same line prompt we are doing it in a way that is is closer to how a normal terminal kind of interacts with the prompt. That's amazing. Um, you want to show us the code for the bind key and stuff? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll show the one for ZSH here. All of, all, all of the shells are kind of uh, similar there. But yeah, and so here I've defined, like, for example, escape P and escape W as uh, as these bind keys that are being used internally by warp. We edit this environment variable that keeps track of whether we are respecting the shell prompt or whether we're respecting the warp prompt and has a bunch of conditional logic related to that. And then the other thing you can see here that we're using is this reset prompt functionality, which is actually a ZLE specific function that allows you to redraw the prompt. We're telling um, ZSH that the prompt has been updated. In this case, for example, we're switching to the warp prompt. So we actually remove the shell prompt in order to make sure that you don't, you don't get a double prompt showing up. Nice. And then what is the uh, specific bind key that you're using? Yeah, so the specific ones are, are escape P and escape W. These are kind of chosen arbitrarily. Why did you choose that? I'm curious. Like, just, uh, so just P, you know. P stands for PS1. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, P stands okay. for PS1 here and W stands for oh, warp. P stands for PS1 and W stands for warp. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> not, not too creative. <laughs> yeah, very logical. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to the thing that we originally promised viewers, which is um, telling them how long it took for you to build same line prompt from start to finish. Um, should we like do a drum roll or something? And like, if you can like announce the number, how long it took you. Okay. Are you ready? That's good. <laughs> and the correct answer is 11 months, close to a year. Um, and so this was a truly like a, a pretty crazy project because it took me like from the depths of our UI framework and input editor and stuff into the depths of like the terminal in the shell and how that interaction works into, there was actually a period of time where I got into like Unicode specifications and how emojis work in Unicode um, and actually opened up issues against ZSH, against Alacrity and against Fish. Uh, and so kind of interacting with different shell maintainers and stuff, which was actually a very cool experience as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think it, overall it was like a pretty insane project to kind of fundamentally rewrite a piece of core warp architecture. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, not not what I expected getting into this project at the start. <laughs> I'm so proud and happy that this is launching. And I think you've done an amazing job on this and, and you should be proud of yourself. And I really hope people use this and also understand how much work went into uh, building it. And I, and I hope like if you're interested in technical aspects, I really hope this video is interesting to you because as Adve said, it covers so much of like all the fundamental parts of, of what makes a terminal experience.